by uh, Christoph Sos Sosnika. We speak about the uh, SLR validation of IGS, GNSS orbits derived in the framework of the ITRS, ITRF 2020 realization. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So my talk will be about the SLR validation of GNSS orbits that were provided by the, uh, by the I, I, uh, IGS in the framework of the ITRF 2020 realization. Uh, for the first time, uh, we have the ITRF uh, realization that is uh, based on three GNSS systems. We have GPS, GLONASS and Galileo that were considered for, for the ITRF res uh, realization. And uh, 10 uh, analysis centers provided the solutions. However, not all of uh, the analysis centers considered um, all three systems. In this presentation, I'm going to concentrate only on those analysis centers that uh, included uh, Galileo data. So we have Center for Orbit Determination in Europe, ESA, GFZ, uh, GRG, MIT, and uh, Technical University Graz that provided the Galileo solutions. Uh, the different analysis centers provided solutions for different periods, and also they used different type of uh, uh, observations. Some of the, uh, of the centers uh, used the double differences, some of them uh, used uh, ion of free uh, combinations, linear combinations of two frequencies. Some of the analysis centers uh, used row approaches. Um, we have also differences in the a priori um, solar radiation pressure models, uh, different empirical uh, parameters that were estimated for the orbits, and also different handling of the stochastic pulses. And SLR is the best tool to validate different, all, uh, different orbit models uh, used by different uh, IGS analysis centers. And here in this presentation, I will show the results for the individual centers as well as uh, for the combined IGS orbits because uh, IGS provided also the, uh, a combination of all uh, analysis centers. Uh, in, in, the, in the first step, there were two combinations, one uh, using the traditional global uh, weighting algorithm uh, for all analysis centers and the second one uh, which was based on satellite specific weighting um, for, for different um, uh, satellites uh, processed by different analysis centers. And here we provide results for different types of the satellites tracked by the SLR. So we have GPS satellites, uh, uh, Galileo fully operational capability, Galileo Fox satellites in eccentric orbit, uh, Galileo in orbit validation satellites, GLONASS M, M plus, and GLONASS K satellites. Uh, SLR. Uh, um, to SLR observations to GNSS orbits uh, provide uh, the information mostly on the radial component. If we decompose uh, the SLR observations, uh, about 96% uh, of the SLR residuals is related to the radial component. We have a small contribution from the along track and cross track at the level of 2%, uh, percent, with a small exception of two Galileo in eccentric orbits when we can recover a little bit more information about the along track component. Most of the observations were provided to Galileo uh, satellites. Here we have the increasing number of uh, Galileo satellites tracked by the SLR stations and also GLONASS satellites. Two GPS satellites in, the, in this period uh, between 2013 and 2020 were spor sporadically observed because uh, these satellites were activated only for very short periods. Uh, here we have already the results of, of the SLR residuals to different uh, uh, satellite types. So we have two GPS satellites, uh, Galileo in orbit validation satellites, Galileo Fox satellites, GLONASS-M, GLONASS-K, 
and uh, we see a positive bias for GLONASS M+, which should be, in principle, more or less the same as GLONASS M, but uh, SLR uh, residuals clearly show that uh, uh, the construction of the satellites or some antenna offsets should be different for, for the latest uh, uh, versions of the GLONASS M uh, satellite. So we can group satellites into, into the uh, types uh, so, and we can analyze the uh, SLR residuals for different groups of the satellites. And here we have the validation using the global weighting and satellite specific weighting. It turned out that uh, the difference is minor between uh, these two approaches. So finally, the, the decision was uh, that the official product of the I, uh, IGS for the, uh, for the orbits will be based on the satellite specific weighting. We have a slightly better statistics for Galileo I of uh, satellites. And nevertheless, the uh, standard deviation of SLR residuals uh, is at the level of 25, uh, 30, 35 uh, millimeters if we take into account um, all, uh, all systems. Uh, to investigate some uh, systematics in the orbits, we typically take into account the satellite sun Earth geometry. So we analyze the SLR residuals as the function of the beta angle. This is the elevation of the sun above the orbital plane. Delta U, which is the argument of latitude of the satellite with respect to the argument of the, of the latitude of the sun. And uh, elongation angle of the satellite with respect to the sun position. And uh, if we uh, do uh, such an analysis and we plot the SLR residuals uh, in, in such a frame, so here we have delta U, here we have uh, the beta angle for Galileo Fock, Galileo eccentric satellites, Galileo I of satellites, GLONASS K1A, GLONASS K1B, GLONASS M, GLONASS M plus, and GPS. Uh, we see some systematic patterns in uh, those uh, residuals. For, uh, for instance, for Galileo Fock, we uh, see clear patterns for the low beta angles. These are the periods when the satellites enter the Earth's shadow, so uh, these are the eclipsing periods for Galileo Fock satellites. We see also a similar pattern for Galileo IOF satellites and for high beta angles when the sun is almost per perpendicular with respect to the orbital plane. Uh, for GLONASS M and GLONASS K1B, on, on average, we, we see almost no patterns, but if we look at the um, residuals as the function of the elongation angle, we see a, a, a large spread of residuals for GLONASS M. So on average, the residuals are close to zero, but uh, the, the standard deviation is much larger than for other satellites. And for instance, uh, if we um, if we compare different types of the retroreflectors, uh, GLONASS K1B are equipped with this kind of the retroreflector with, uh, this is the ring retroreflector, whereas uh, GLONASS M uh, is equipped with the rectang uh, rectangular, so the classical retroreflector for um, uh, GNSS uh, satellites. Okay, we can also analyze the source of those systematic patterns. So we can have a look at individual analysis centers because they use different orbit modeling for, uh, for, uh, for their models. Uh, so here we have the results from Technical University of Graz, MIT. This is the combination. This is uh, Center for Orbit Determination in Europe. This is ESA, this is GFZ, this is uh, GRG. And we see, for instance, that ESA and Theo Graz have no issues with the eclipsing periods for Galileo fully operational capability satellites. 
uh, so these two centers um, are free of uh, the, these problems because they use the a priori box wing model uh, for uh, for Galileo satellites and they also estimate the ECOM or ECOM2 parameters on the top of the uh, a priori box wing models. All other centers have larger or smaller issues with the eclipsing periods. So the combination is also affected by all other analysis centers. So, so we, we have a leakage of these uh, systematic patterns into the combination. If we look at the statistics, uh, it turns out that uh, sometimes the statistics are better for some individual centers than for the combination because of the, those systematic patterns. But uh, solar radiation pressure modeling is not the only issue we can find in SLR residuals. We can uh, find also other uh, issues related directly to SLR. If we uh, split the SLR network into the multi-photon stations using the MCP uh, detectors and single photon CISPAD detectors, here we have the results only for the European CISPAD detectors, we see completely different patterns uh, for the SLR residuals as a function of the nadir angle. Uh, so here we have uh, zero degrees. So, so when the laser is perpendicular with respect to the uh, with respect to the um, retroreflector, and here we have uh, the maximum nadir angle uh, for Galileo Fock or Galileo Eye of uh, satellites, and we see that multi-photon uh, stations have typically a slope uh, of the residuals and uh, typically a larger offset, whereas the CSPAT stations show um, more or less a flat course for the uh, residual dependencies. And if we now split the SLR network into CSPAT detectors, uh, most of them uh, come from Europe, CISPAT, uh, the Chinese CISPAT stations, uh, MCP stations, so most of them uh, belong to the NASA network, and PMT detectors, uh, most of them belong to the Russian network. And uh, if we analyze the mean offsets for different types of the detectors, we can find the differences uh, at the level of 30 millimeters uh, so even larger than the standard deviation of the, uh, of, of the results. For instance, for Galileo Fox satellites, we, we obtain completely different results for different types of the detectors. And the same we have, for, for instance, for the GPS satellites, uh, etc. So uh, clearly we have a lot of uh, detector-specific issues uh, in the results uh, of the SLR validation. And now if we calculate the statistics for different types uh, of the satellites and different types of the detectors, it turns out that, that the standard deviation is uh, for the CISPAT at the level of 14 millimeters uh, for Galileo Fox, 16 millimeters for uh, MCP detectors. For GPS, it's even at the level of 12 millimeters and 40 millimeters for MCP uh, stations. So, so the um, so it seems that the uh, detector-specific residuals dominate uh, the, the combination. Uh, so we tried to normalize the uh, SLR residuals, but by removing the offsets, it means by adjusting the offsets to the CISPAT European uh, detectors. And we repeated the analysis, and it turned out that we can reduce the standard deviation of SLR residuals even by 15 millimeters if we uh, introduce uh, three uh, biases uh, for different detector types. So here we have a comparison between the uh, regular validation, and here if we take into account the detector biases with respect to the um, CISPAT, uh, so single photon detectors, because we assume that the uh, single photon de detectors typically um, are uh, affected by the signature effect to the, to the uh, smallest extent. 
Um, here we have the result for all satellites, and in principle, for all satellites, we have a clear offset between these two types of the detectors, so uh, multi-photon uh, detectors and single-photon de detectors, and uh, typically the slope is much larger for multi-photon detectors. To sum up, uh, for the first time, three GNSS systems uh, contributed to the IT realization. Uh, SLR is an independent tool to validate the quality of GNSS orbits for Galileo and GLONASS. The standard deviation of SLR residuals is at the level of 25 millimeters, but after removing the detector-specific errors, it can be reduced to 12, 16 millimeters. Uh, analysis of SLR residuals in some Earth satellite frame indicates some issues in the orbit modeling for the individual types of the GNSS satellites. Some of these issues have already been mitigated by some IGS analysis centers, uh, but there is still space for improvement in the combination strategy. Large differences between single photon and multi photon detectors have been found, even uh, between single photon detectors installed in the uh, European stations and Chinese stations. Um, there are only minor differences between the two delivered sets of combined solutions, which differ in terms of the weighting strategy. Satellite specific weighting is the official IGS product. In the future steps, uh, uh, GPS and BEIDO satellites should be equipped with the SLR retroreflectors and tracked by the SLR stations to provide information on orbit modeling issues. Otherwise, it's uh, extremely difficult to say which orbit modeling approach is better and uh, which uh, performs worse. We can only compare the results between different analysis centers. Uh, also, GNSS allows for the collocation in space, so it should be considered for the future uh, IT rev realizations and also uh, the combination of SLR and GNSS should be considered for GNSS orbit determination. Uh, why? Here we have an example. So, if we use just the uh, ECHO models on the empirical uh, orbit model for Galileo FOC and IOF satellites. We have this pattern for the eclipsing periods and also a pattern, uh, systematic pa pattern for the high beta angles for the IOF satellites. If we use the a priori box wing model, then the eclipsing pattern almost disappears, almost completely disappears, but we still have the pattern for the high beta angles. And now, if we combine microwave GNSS plus SLR observations, we almost reduce all patterns that are, uh, that are included in SLR residuals, not only in the SLR residuals, because SLR uh, tells us uh, about the quality of the, of the model and quality of the solution. So we remove uh, most of the systematics from the SLR solution. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have a quick question online. Uh, do you estimate any SLR station range biases in your analysis when you use information on this station, for this station from the ITRF 2020? Uh, no, in this analysis we didn't estimate any range biases. No parameters were estimated. We looked into the uh, pure residuals as provided uh, by, by the SLR stations. SLR observations. So these uh, were the observed minus computed residuals, so, so, so the uh, measured distances with respect to the a priori values provided by the a priori reference frame, so SLR, uh, SLRF 2014, and the, uh, the calculated uh, GNSS orbit positions. Okay, thank you.